Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Hot Pot Talks. Um, my name is David Ng, and this is my dear friend and longtime creative partner, Jen Sunshine. And we are coming to you live from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Squamish and Slavit Musqueam, Squamish, and Slavitooth First Nations. Um, you might know us as the co-artistic directors of Love Intersections, a media arts collective that produces documentary films about uh, QT BIPOCs. Um, we're also members of the uh, Value Co-op, which is the Vancouver Artist Labor Union Cooperative. Um, as you can see, I'm not home. I'm usually beaming from my living room. <laughs> um, I'm actually uh, at the Griffin Arts Projects in uh, Squamish and Slave with Tooth uh, Territory, AKA North Vancouver, um, at the exhibit, Who's Chinatown, which was curated by our guest today, Karen Tam. Y'all know the drill by now. Hot Pot Talks is a weekly series live streaming to YouTube and Facebook every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, where we have free flowing conversations with artists, activists, chefs, performers, poets, and community organizers about what it means to be an artist facing today's realities. What ethical responsibilities do we have as artists? What community organizing and art making looks like during quarantine, all the while sharing our favorite hot pot ingredients. We don't have any hot pot with us right now. David no. usually has the sad <laughs> But I'm at an art gallery, so no. Um, yeah, so why, why, why did we come up with Hot Pot Talks? Um, we've mentioned this a few times, but I kind of, we kind of wanted to recenter re Chinatowns again, especially because um, who, of who we're talking to today, Karen, who's done a lot of work um, in Chinatowns across uh, Canada. Um, Value Co-op is located in the Lim Sai Hor Kao Mok Society uh, building in Chinatown. And when we moved into Chinatown, and we, uh, we really recognized um, and reflected on the ways that artists have contributed to gentrification and displacement. And we had long conversations about how we uh, could be proactive and generative and reciprocal about um, building solidarities um, and supporting the community um, that we are in. And so through our community projects uh, working group, which Jen and I are a part of, uh, we're doing a collaboration with the Lim Association and the elders on the board, who I've known for a very long time, um, on a project called Engaging Chinatown, which will be where we'll be digitizing their archives. Um, and originally pre-COVID, we were going to turn it into an immersive visual art exhibit. Um, and so we're finding, trying to find new ways to reimagine what that might look like. Um, and Hot Pot, Talk is, Hot Pot Talks <laughs> is one of those ways that we're rethinking or reimagining how we can connect with people people about issues related to Chinatown. Um, I just wanted to give a uh, mention again, of course, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm at the Griffin Arts Project. Um, last week, we talked uh, quite a bit about um, A Seat at the Table, um, which is uh, the, an exhibit that's at the Museum of Vancouver. Um, but I also wanted to talk, uh, feature this exhibit today, um, which is called Who's Chinatown? Exam Examining Chinatown Gazes in Art, Archives and Collections. Um, which brings together an art history of Chinatowns and their communities by historical and contemporary Canadian artists su such as Yu Cho Chow, Fred Herzog, Paul Wong, Mary Sue Yi Wong, and others. So we're, before we bring on Karen, I wanted to do a shameless plug. Um, I will thinking, model. <laughs> in thinking about these themes of nourishment and love and community building, um, we wanted to plug our limited edition tote bags that David is holding in his hands right now. Have you eaten today simply means I love you in BIPOC language. A simple question asked by so many of our parents, elders and aunties everywhere, evoking a shared familial understanding of love and tenderness. And these feelings of unspoken care inspired hot pot talks where culture and community nourish our bodies and for our hearts too. Um, so I just wanted to also give a shout out to our lovely UBC practicum students who are in the back end helping out, um, Lamia, Cameron, Ava, Jessica, and Victoria. Uh, so without further ado, I am thrilled to introduce Karen Tam, guest curator at Griffin Art Projects. Welcome, Karen. Oh. We lost Oh her. no, we lost her. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Okay, well, I'm just going to kill some time. Um, we've lost uh, we lost Karen. So, in the meantime, I'm going to show some of uh, Karen's works on her website, which is really really cool. Um, and I'm going to center the link to get back in. <laughs> Great. Look at how uh, smooth and professional we are. We know what we're doing. <laughs> Just uh, I'm going to talk very slowly as uh, we kill some time. 
<laughs> um, so this is a beautiful, the most current work that Karen has done. By the way, uh, I was gonna save this for when Karen's actually on the talk with us, but I had no idea Karen Tam has a Wikipedia page. It's it's just, <laughs> it's incredible. I'm gushing, I'm gonna be gushing for the entirety of the Hoppa Talks, but this is a 2020 exhibition. The Chrysanthemum has opened 12 times um, at the Cochler Center of the Arts in Toronto. Uh, super, super cool. Uh, look at this. It's just like beautiful, um, beautiful work. Uh, and David, I'm just like, this is what we want to do, right? Oh, there she is. Okay, so I can stop sharing. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Hi. It's okay. <laughs> I won't like, lie, I had a small moment of panic. <laughs> okay, we, we got a cover. I started showing your website and past exhibitions. We have you have so much work for us to go through. Like I was like, I'm not even worried. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was just like, of course the internet would go down. Like we checked yeah. everything else, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are you good now? Are you stable? <laughs> yes. Stable. Great. Good, good to go. <laughs> awesome. Well, Karen, I thought, because um, I actually wanted to position myself with the more pieces behind me, but I thought maybe just to, maybe we could start uh, start off by connecting our last week's conversation, mm. um, because I'm, sit I'm sitting actually right in front of um, the piece that you did um, with the work that Aya Collective did. Um, for those who weren't, uh, who didn't watch uh, last week, um, we had a conversation with Aya Collective, uh, which is this uh, group of, uh, intergenerational group of artists and activists in Edmonton, um, that did this um, organizing, um, I guess a protest, but also a commemoration of the removal of the, the Harbin Gate um, in, in, Edmonton, in Edmonton. And um, Karen, you did some, and, and so I, uh, Wai Ling shared with us um, that they were inspired by this, um, I think it was by, uh, I don't know more actually about how they commemorated mm -hmm. missing and murdered indigenous women. And so they tied these notes, I think, um, to the place where the gate was removed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, can you maybe tell, Karen, I'm curious, how did that, how did you meet Aya Collective? How did the work come about? Um, I think I met them through Friends of Chinatown, Toronto, through, through Shelley Jang. Um, kind of last year when I was just starting um, to do my research for this for this exhibition uh, and kind of just talking to Shelly and, and kind of like wondering you know, like if she had suggestions of other artists that she um, thought I should check the work out. And then she put me in touch with, with the collective um, and it just kind of went from there where they shared um, with me uh, you know this work, like you know, through through images and and documentation, and just the conversations, and I just felt that it was such an important work um, because um, that it was in a way a, a work that reflected their activism and engagement with community, with um, with the history. And looking back at um, the history of the Chinese in Edmonton, China, uh, Edmonton's Chinatown, and in a way, it's like pushing back at this at this erasure mm. of um, of our community, um, of its landmarks, um, and and it was I just thought it was such a such a moving work um, that I wanted to somehow include it in this exhibition. Um, you know, we talked about I, like on sort of next to the piece behind you is the documentation of um, the 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 event that they put on um, where the, the vigil um, memorializing uh, the removal uh, dismantlement of the Harbin Gate um, in Chinatown and. Like you said, and, and as, as the collective had uh, told you um, last week, that they encourage community members to share their memories and wishes. So, in, in, and that they would be written on um, these notes or the calligraphy. Um, and in a way, they're like the wishing, the, the, the wishes that, you know, the wishing trees. Um, mm. And so, you know, uh, with with Grace and and Sean Wiling and Lan, we talked about how else that we could perhaps think about um, having um, not remaking the piece, but thinking about how we could um, 
kind of do a, a, an iteration mm. of of this piece for the for the Griffin show and and thinking about ways that um, you know ways that artists uh, you know go, work through issues through the work uh, through through their artwork. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And so and, and then you then do this other this extra added iteration of in some ways is like a is an appropriation of the the artwork because i i, I read on your um on your website my gosh uh, somewhere around the techniques of appropriation and of course mm -hmm. there's a lot of confusion i think around the word appropriation mm -hmm. it's taken on a a, a, a perhaps a, a socially different meaning now culturally mm -hmm. different meaning mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, i'm so curious how you can you just give us like um take us through that process of you like inviting i collective mm -hmm. understanding their artists process and then kind of and attempting to iterate that process yourself and how mm -hmm. your process goes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that was very that was a lot <laughs> So um, I hadn't really thought about what I was doing for Who's Chinatown as a way of appropriation, but it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's another kind of strategy because I guess when I th think of appropriation, maybe like everyone else, a lot of yeah. people when we talk about appropriation, we talk about cultural appropriation. Yeah. Um, but I think for in this case for Who's Chinatown. Um, it's bringing the appropriation is is really bringing the work of other artists together to have this mm -hmm. conversation that's between us as artists. Uh, I mean, I am the curator of the show, but I see myself first and foremost as an artist, as a fellow artist, mm -hmm. um, to have these conversations between us, but also for the works to yeah. to, to have meet. a conversation with each other. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, yeah, I had a question because um, yeah, that really resonated with me. Even the question is quite provocative, like who's Chinatown? Yeah. Because I think, I, and I've had such a, we talked about this last week too, but with Paul Wong, whose work is behind me. <laughs> <laughs> the like his, his neon sign um, is behind this um, installation. Um, I remember Paul, meant, we had this conversation about how, um, even though we're of course in different generations, we're of the, in, in our families, the generation that, um, our parents left left Chinatown, and we're the ones mm -hmm. that are trying to come back, quote unquote. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, 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 and you know, for because of the really tense politics in, in in Chinatown, I had a lot of sort of personally had a lot of not reservations, but I really sort of um, thought hard about my place in Chinatown and claiming mm -hmm. space in Chinatown and what does that mean? Um, what is that the accountability of that or responsibility that I have um, when I want to part, you know, when, mm -hmm. when as we mentioned earlier, like with value co-op moving into Chinatown. Um, I'm curious because like a lot of, um, Jen and I were looking at your work, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, and because and, 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 you're doing a lot of work with many different Chinatowns. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell me about that? Um, your approach or your, mm -hmm. your, what you're investigating or? Mm -mm -mm. Um, I guess, especially with this project, I'm, I, when I started um, on this, on the research for this, it was really to see what was out there in terms of historical artworks that mm -hmm. depicted Chinatowns. Um, I, I was asked to do some uh, on a separate, a separate thing uh, to do some research uh, on some, well, actually, it's actually related. <laughs> now that I think about it, it's some of the historical um, sketches in the second room, the smaller room. It was just helping, um, helping one of the museums uh, kind of try to identify some of these buildings in Montreal Chinatown. Um, mm. And they're sketches by uh, Paul Caron, um, uh, made between like around 1919, 1921 or so. And kind of, you know, I, I can, I could just go down to Chinatown, see where, see wh which buildings were possibly depicted. Um, but of course, like other Chinatowns, um, parts of the Montreal China, uh, Chinatown were expropriated. Um, so it was possible that the buildings didn't exist. Anyway, so as I was doing 
you know, th this, uh, this research and trying to look in other archives and museum collections, um, if there were other other like drawings or or, or, or paintings that I can reference, um, and also uh, photographs too, and there was there was a few, but there wasn't a, a whole lot, um, and so that just kind of made me think, why I know these exist, they're just not in the like more official um, kind of mainstream archives. They're actually in people's homes and right. family albums and stuff. Um, maybe they're not seen by the owners as that important, mm -hmm. but I think they are um, because yeah. they, they do tell and they fill, um, they fill or will fill the gaps in um, our knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I was thinking of, because some of, I think most of those historical works I was looking at were works by um, white, yes yeah. <laughs> right yeah <laughs> and um you know that in a way is problematic you yeah. know how, how it's it's the outsider gaze it's the white gaze um into uh you know a, a cultural community um in its neighborhood so i wanted to kind of start for myself just like compiling um works that i thought um were important um in that they show this, you know, Chinatowns from the the, the community's perspective, um, from its residents, um, and that's kind of where it started. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I just want to, it's so, it's so interesting, like, um, you know, there's, there's this exhibit right now, there's a seat at the table, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's, so, you know, and the, the, the Friends of Chinatown in Toronto, AYA Collective, yeah. all of the organized, Youth Collaborative for Chinatown here. Oh, also, oh, can I just also yeah. interject um, that uh, Florence Yi and um, one of her, uh, and she's collaborating with another artist whose name I just blanking right now, they're, they're organizing the first ever Chinatown Biennial. And they just put out a call for this. So, oh my god! Yeah, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, like, what has been? Because you, I'm, I'm, you're in in contact with many of these groups across Canada. What's the? What is your sense of what's happening right now? Is that are there patterns or themes that are that are consistent? I know gentrification is obviously a big mm -hmm. one, displacement. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you're if you're hearing any uh, uh, similar themes across. Um. I think, I mean, I just from my research and the conversations that it just seems like Chinatown or Chinese Canadian, Chinese American, um, like the young generation, when I say young generation, I just mean everybody who's like under, yeah, you know, yeah, we 80, <laughs> that um, everyone seems to, eventually be extremely engaged um, and, and active in Chinatown um, and, and to really, um, you know, do everything that they can to, uh, you know, to help, to help one another. Um, th so throughout the decades that has happened. And so I think this is, I don't know, maybe part of it is the gentrification. Um, and I think like you were saying, like we're of that generation who wants to come back to Chinatown? You know, well, our parents left Chinatown so that you know, <laughs> so that we can come back. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and more so ever, I just I see so many more Asian like activists. Yeah. Like yeah. more than any other time that, that mm -hmm. I've experienced in the community. There's so many, um, mm -hmm. and so there's there must be some kind of. Yeah, there, there's a there's a not a trend, but there yeah. is a movement. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, for sure. Um, I guess like one other thing, just to um, mm -hmm. comment on what you said earlier, David, is that I think there's also like this resurgence or a mini resurgence of like my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation of coming back to Chinatown, um, like when they retire or uh, well, not when they retire, excuse me, um, that the, the senior resident, like the, the, the residents for, for, um, for the elders 
that they come back and they're in Chinatown, they prefer that because yeah. like the banks are there, the groceries that are there, um, the restaurants, like everything that they need mm. is like walking distance. And, and like in Montreal, like the, 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 um, the big super hospital, it's literally a block away from Chinatown. So it's like really convenient. Right. Um, so I, I think there's that too. And, and that, um, you know, it's easy for them to also take part in like all the clubs and the association events and activities. It is really incredible. Um, I just wanted to share a story. Uh, I think this was uh, maybe five years ago, David, we were filming um, at Hello Cool World, which is the, the, the Limb Association building on Carroll, Carroll Street. Mm -hmm. And we were filming um, in the apartment and we just, I hear a knock on the door and this like elderly Chinese man walks in and was like, I'm, I'm just looking around to see what's here. And I'm just like talking to him, I'm talking to him. And I'm just, you know, I, as I do with, with an elder, I'm very respectful and polite, but I'm also like so curious about, mm. he's like, yeah, I used to, I used to work here in the eighties. Mm. Turns out he is being Tom um the late oh. architect <laughs> yeah yeah wow. it was being tom um may he rest in peace rest in power um yeah and 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 later on i actually have a close friend of mine who works in at being tom um at the company and so i was like holy shit that was the last <laughs> time i saw him so and i keep hearing this type of story um from just like just friends who who have spaces in Chinatown where you know they'll just the, someone will walk in and be like yeah I use I have a story here mm -hmm. um so it's so mm -hmm. rich uh yeah anyway I just mm -hmm. thought I'd share that yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you more mm -hmm. about the project I, I know one of the talks that you had mentioned a little bit and we had talked about this um previously about the project the archival project that you're doing with the limb association um, yeah, I mean, so that project, um, so I've worked, so Hello Cool World um, is on the second floor of, so Value Club is on the ground floor, Hello Cool World's on the second floor. Um, mm -hmm. Hello Cool World has been in that building for over 20 years now, or 20 years now. Um, and so um, I spent a lot of time in the building. I, I've worked for Hello Cool World for all that time as well. Um, and so I've gotten to know um, the, the elders on the board. Um, and so, Fast forward to um, when Value Corp was invited to um, uh, to lease that space. Um, we had a conversation. <clears throat> a bunch of us, um, the uh, uh, the board invited us upstairs to the top floor, which is where um, they're located. Um, and we just had a conversation with them about. I actually forgot what the meeting was about, <laughs> but they were really they were so generous with sharing with us. Um, about the history of the building. We had questions about the building. They shared with us stories. Um, and uh, just in passing, one of the elders mentioned like, oh yeah, I think one of, our, you know, one of our members pointed to some of these really old, beautiful old books. And I, um, Emily was like, oh, Emily, you know Emily. Um, uh, Emily was like, you know, what are these books? And, and the elder was like, oh yeah, they're, they're, I forgot what they were, but you know, they're really old. We'd love to digitize them. Mm. And in that same conversation, he was like, oh, we've always really wanted a website too. And then of course, being artists, we are like, oh my goodness, this is so, this could be so cool. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, this was, this was a couple, two years ago now, like almost, um, or a year and a half ago. And so we, we put together this, um, project proposal to digitize the archives, but also like there's so much, so such a rich history, literally in the books and also in, in mm -hmm. the walls of the building. There's, I, I could, I could tell you even just me, just so many stories I know of, of, of the building. And so we thought what a, what a, what a, what a way that perhaps that we could use, um, look at the archives and then collaborate with the elders to mm -hmm. turn it into some sort of public facing, um, something yeah, um, yeah including like there's a, the, just some of the incredible um oral histories that we've heard um finding ways to to turn those into a sort of more audio uh, sonic um installation or, or something mm, mm, mm. yeah oh, it sounds wonderful <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, we're very excited about it. <laughs> it made me think about how, like, how, the the Tam Association. One one of the Tam Hum associations in Montreal were actually all like all three of them. Um, but the one that's like on the top floor um, that I remember, you know, my dad taking me there every Sunday. And I mean, as an ad as a adult too, I I kind of go there. Um, you know, a few times a year. It's like they have all these paintings and they have all these photographs and they have, um, well, we did have um, a statue which uh, had been exhibited at the museum, at the time was known as the Museum of Civilization in Ottawa or Hull. Um, Gatineau, sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm totally dating myself. Um, <laughs> But 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 then like in the '90s it was um, it was stolen, and you know just like all these things that might have have vanished. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like who knows what else vanished. Um, and and so I I I was hearing about your project. I was just feel really inspired. Like I want to do something too. <laughs> just as cool. Maybe I can elaborate. Yeah, one of the stories, like, and we're, we're, we have a potential. Um, we we want to do something with this too. Is um, so the building, um, the building was built originally by the Chinese Empire Reform Society. So this is the building in the limb of the limb association, and there's this like legend that. Um, that there's a time capsule that were built in under the foundations with like some gold oh. coins in them, and it they credit it for be um, for the prosperity that has come out of the building, <laughs> and so they've actually I think in, I, I don't I got some coins here. Oh, ah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think in one of the buildings they've actually even um, I don't know where I don't I don't remember where but they actually ex excavated the time capsule. Um, yeah, it's really incredible. So we, I'd love to do some sort of like some project around that too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Karen, I wanted to ask you about um, your the Gold Mountain series, the the restaurants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I, I was really drawn to it because my um, my aunt my aunt used to own a Chinese restaurant. A Ch I'm gonna I'm gonna date myself now. A Chinese mm -hmm. a Chinese smogus board. <laughs> Called uh, called the Golden Rickshaw. <laughs> Those who are in Vancouver, it was directly across from Celebrities Nightclub, <laughs> but they 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 sold it all, you know tw over twenty years ago. Um, can you tell me about that? And 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 I have so many resonances with a, a lot of the iconographies from Chinese restaurants. Just be, growing mm -hmm. up, my parents for the for the longest time had one of those red corner banquettes. When when my aunt sold the restaurant, we took. Uh, Quite a bit of the furniture so like the yeah. chairs in my i think we still have the chairs too you know those like red the red yes. chairs oh my gosh yes. those are the ones that i have still in my parents house we had a corner banquette you know oh, from the restaurant yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah can you tell me about that about that word um well that that the gold mountain restaurant series uh, i started that it was actually started as my mfa thesis like final yeah. project um and that was just one table two chairs <laughs> and a menu <laughs> and um i think what i had done was uh, like around that time my parents um were talking about selling their restaurant um it was it was in the east end montreal called restaurant au set bonheur and it was a place i grew up in like we li we lived above the restaurant um they they um, they started in basically when I was ten months old. So and wow. they so it was like really like the place I, I grew up in. And when they talked about selling it in two thousand one, um, I was in grad school. And so it just started as like I need to document everything. I need to take photos, videos, sketches, everything. <laughs> I don't know. And I even thought of like making a Lego model. But I, I didn't have enough Lego pieces. <laughs> this is, this is, first of all, Karen, um, you just answered like two of my biggest questions that I had, which was like how and where you grew up and tell us some stories. And then the other question I had was around um, how you knew like when you wanted to be an artist. It's like mm -hmm. you just answered all of that. <laughs> um, please continue. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and and so 
I, I guess I had always been interested in the history of Chinese uh, in Canada. And then just like, it just kind of, when my parents talk about this, it, I just thought, how come everybody we know runs a restaurant? Like, yeah. what's with that? Um, and so kind of, you know, doing more research and, and um, you know, the, all the legislation and, and kind of pressures that led to, um, you know, jobs not being open to the Chinese community. Um, so anyways, just that's, and so what I wanted to do once my parents talked about uh, selling the restaurant and in 2004, they, they, um, they did sell the restaurant um, that I wanted to um, capture my, you know, the place that I grew up in, but also look at how um, these places were so important in the foodscape mm. of, of Canada, right? That these, the Chinese restaurants, Chinese Canadian restaurants, Chinese yeah. American restaurants were yeah. the pioneers in opening up the palates of, of many Canadians. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, looking at this kind of food where, you know, it's been demonized a lot, yeah. you know, the egg rolls and chop soy, chow mein, um, but it's like a hybrid, hybrid Chinese cuisine. Mm -hmm. um, and it put a lot of us through school. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, I wanted to pay homage to those experiences. So mm -hmm. um, one of the first ones uh, that I did um, of this of this restaurant was in Halifax. And I also gave myself like this challenge of, okay, I'm not gonna do work in the studio. I'm gonna go out into the community. Um, and it was like a really hard lesson um, to figure out, like to learn how to go into the community and work with people, how to mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. um, and the best way that, that I learned was don't do it over the phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always do it in person. Go in person. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, start off by saying that my parents ran a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so did my uncle and my grandparents worked. In. Also, I'm my family's toy mm. Um that, that seemed to really open up. Um, you know, a lot of doors. Um, they're like, wow, you, your Chinese is so great. And I'd be like, no, it's terrible. They're like, no, like you're Canadian born. It's great. You can speak <laughs> like two words. It's fun. It's, it's wonderful. Um, yeah. And, and so um, with this project, I wanted to, and I've shown it in over 50, like in over 15 locations across Canada, yeah. um, a few places in the UK and um, one, one, one place in, in uh, Connecticut. And wow. it's the same project, but it always looks different because I want to reflect the local taste, local history by, you know, mo most of the time I will spend between like two weeks to up to like two months um, to do research, to contact uh, you know, members, like current or retired restaurant workers or owners, and then to see what kind of uh, props um, and stuff that I can, that I could borrow from people and that I could source. Mm -hmm. um, and also it allowed me the time to have these conversations and actually um, have a, make, include some video interviews with, mm. with these owners. So that, you know, cause I was thinking a lot of um, the restaurateurs, like they don't have time to go to yeah. see exhibitions they don't see themselves yeah in our museums in our galleries so yeah. i wanted to in a way show them to themselves but including like stuff from their restaurants or including um their family photographs wow. um and and also what was really great when i showed this uh in montreal um the the following year so it was in 2004 um my parents had just sold the restaurant like the month before my exhibit. And I had my first thought was like, no, couldn't you have waited until my <laughs> show was done so I can like borrow all the stuff? stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking truly like an artist. <laughs> I'm so curious of the 15 locations in Canada, mm -hmm. were there any in like rural BC? Because, because these Chinese Canadian restaurants are so iconic. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. used to do a lot of rural traveling um, in BC going to schools, doing presentations, and you always 
you always pass by that one, that single soul Chinese mm -hmm. Canadian restaurant yeah. in that small rural town yeah. um, with the like one Chinese family, you know, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a rural setting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just curious if you uh, featured any DC ones. Um, not rural, not but, rural. Yeah, but Kelowna. Kelowna. <laughs> <Close enough. laughs> I know, I know it's not rural. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I've shown in any like rural place. It's mostly been towns and cities. Towns and cities. Um yeah, yeah. Um yeah, so in BC it was Kelowna. Um and then I also showed it at Center A. Um, oh yes, of course. In two thousand seven. And um other places that I've shown. Were there. Lethbridge. Lethbridge. Okay. Good. <laughs> Saskatoon. Are you visualizing the map? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing yeah. like, I do that too. <laughs> um, Brandon, Manitoba. Um, and then like yeah. Toronto, <laughs> Windsor, London, uh, Montreal, uh, St. TSA. Um, and uh saint john mm. halifax so cool and i haven't shown okay so i haven't shown it in um pi or newfoundland um yeah so cool yeah that really you know it, it, i was thinking about karen when you were talking about like um the the, the hybrid of of what Chinese food is in North America. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I really learned this, um, and this isn't in North America, but, um, and I think, you know, also growing up in Vancouver and being around like a lot of, a lot of different types of Chinese food. I remember I went, so I was living in, um, I was living in, I lived in South Africa for a couple of years. And I remember my friend was like, oh, we wanted, we're really happy. They were, wanted to take me to a Chinese restaurant. And I, I did not recognize what this was like it was it was like sweet and sour chicken balls and like lemon chicken and stuff like that and i talked to my partner my partner grew up in a small um in a small or a, or a small town north of toronto and i was like what what is that like chicken balls he's like yeah we grew up with that i had we had, yeah, our yeah. Chinese restaurant had that too chicken balls and yeah. lemon chicken <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, Karen, so now getting a little bit more serious. Um, I, so, <laughs> serious I, I saw, Yeah, I saw <laughs> so some of the work. Um, actually, I think that's on this the wall over there. Maybe I'll go over there in a second. Um, but I also the, the the some of the work that you have, the sketches that you have um, at the gallery. I'm not going to try to pronounce the name, <laughs> um, but it reflects um, some of like it reflects some serious topics like anti Asian mm -hmm. racism. Mm -hmm. Like I think you you documented like the defacing of the lions. Um, can you can you tell me a little bit about that work? And maybe I'll maybe I'll walk over there and, and sure, yeah. show my camera there. Sure, sure. So um, the sketches, like my own sketches, the, the wallpaper? Yeah. Or yeah. The, the historical sketches. Uh, the, the wallpaper that you okay. did. And also, because yeah. I think those some of those pieces are, the sketches are at the, the gallery. Um, Charbonnet? Charbonneau? Oh, Charbonneau. Charbonneau. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I don't, I'm not going to try to pronounce we, we try to Google how to pronounce these, uh, these words. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, sorry. So like Hugues Charbonneau, um, the, the, show, the show just opened today. Um, and um, so these drawings were a set of drawings of, of, I think, 14 drawings in total that I made this past, the past year. Um, so yeah, so you can see them um, on David's screen. Um, so those are some that I, I transformed into um, a wallpaper pattern. Um, so reading, you know, reading all these stories in the news of, um, you know, elders being attacked, individual, like indiv Asians or Asian looking um, mm -hmm. individuals being attacked. Um, uh, you know, be, and being unjustly blamed for spreading COVID, um, and the Chinatowns like icons, um, mar be, and markers of Chinatowns, and, and, and the the spaces being vandalized. Um, that was that was really hard. Yeah. I think it was really hard for a lot of folks. And um, 
And I wanted to work this through for myself by um, and really draw, like depicting these as drawings, as static drawings. Um, around this time when I, I was doing the research of the drawings that you see like on the, the historical works, that's that's like in front of the the, the wallpaper. Um, you know, and thinking that these were made in the you know, 1920s or so, Montreal yeah. Chinatown, the outsider gaze looking in. And then um, if David goes to the photographs, you know, where you see the anti the anti Asian riots of 1907, mm -hmm. you know, like um, just all all these things were just in my head, and in how like we actually haven't really gone that like we haven't really got progressed. No, you know, if that was like 1907, that was more than a hundred years ago, yeah, and it's still happening, yeah. um, and so. And I mean, this the the drawings were really were for myself to work out my anger um, and um, despair mm -hmm. of of what's been happening. Um, and uh, by creating in a way, cr creating a wallpaper that's very much in the in the um, feeling of or, or the look of chinoiserie, which mm -hmm. is, you know, like the, European, like historically, the European take on what Chinese art uh, and, and culture is, um, that um, presenting these really violent um, events, um, yeah. it, I, I was hoping that it would take people by surprise. You just kind of think, oh, that's really pretty. Right. right? And then you see, and then I also wanted to, in a way, challenge some of these historical um, sketches by by you know having them placed on 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 what seems to be like a very innocent um, yeah. friendly <laughs> <laughs> wallpaper. It's very provocative and it's it's also very moving. Um, I it's I, I was I resonate with a lot of what you're saying in terms of that despair and that anger. Um, I, I don't think we've, we've even as a, as a collective entity have even processed mm. that, that trauma yet because it's mm -hmm. ongoing and it's yeah. historical, but it's also like ongoing and it's, um, and it's scary, um, you know, and my parents, they live in fear for my life all the time. They just, they just think the world is so dangerous. And mm -hmm. because I'm an only child, they, they live in that constant state of fear. And then I'm here thinking, my God, I fear for them too, because they're elderly and they only have each other and yeah. they're, you know, English is, is, is not great. It's so there's so many factors that, um, that we all contend with living in our bodies, like um, intersected with, you know, for me being a woman as well, like I I'm, I feel like this pandemic has, if anything, this pandemic has revealed for me is the sense of like agoraphobia and like, I'm just so scared of the world outside. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. But thanks, thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess it, this was leading to one of my uh, a question that I had. Um, like, is is art activism? Is art social critique? What are the divisions between them? Are, what are the connections? Are they the what, same thing? And what's was, happening back there? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's the audio from one of the videos. Possibly, I think in the in the in the oh, back room. Okay. <laughs> but I was curious. Um, uh, what was my question? Uh, um, activism, art. activism, art. Yeah, because yeah. I'm, and I also think about like the the context in like I'm I'm thinking you know Jen when we had our show last year um on and one of the things we were thinking about was queer queer East Asian futures, and when COVID hit and when you know the events um Karen that you're mentioning around like the spike in anti Asian racism, mm -hmm. all of a sudden that work about envisioning futures really shifted and had new context, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking. I'm thinking about art and social context and mm -hmm. what art can do mm -hmm. in 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 conversation or in mm -hmm. in, in a more in a sort of generative activist sort yeah. of approach. Yeah, yeah. That's a terrible question, but I'm, I'm yeah. wondering <laughs> if you no, I, I think art is activism. Mm -hmm. Um there can 
you can have the really formal kind of art that speaks about art, but um, I think all art can be um, seen as activist. And I, I think um, if we take, for example, the work of Friends of Chinatown Toronto, which I have the documentation of at the front of the gallery, um, uh, take, for example, their project, their um, parody development sign um, that was in response, and this was in 2019, uh, that they put up um, in, in Toronto Chinatown in response to the city of Toronto's monolingual uh, development sign, um, you know, thinking about like, well, access to the residents, to the business owners, um, you know, to say like newly arrived um, um, immigrants or residents, like how will they know what this information is about and that there's a town hall and a, a consultation process. Mm -hmm. And um, what was amazing about their parody development sign, which was bilingual, um, was that it, well, basically the city of Toronto then responded and put out the first like bilingual development sign. Wow. So like that's very a concrete way of how art has um, affected change. And do you, and what language do you speak in your, in your home? And I'm also curious if you have any, um, if you have, a creative relationship with any family members where you <laughs> collaborate on art. Well, yeah. and I, I thought it was, it was, I saw your photo on Instagram of your mom help, helping you with the banner. <laughs> sorry, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I, I collaborate with my parents a lot. I, I, yeah. I collaborated a lot more before, but um, I guess a few years ago I was getting the sense, I think my parents were kind of hinting to me that, you know, I should, I, I should be a bit more independent. <laughs> um, and especially my mom, she's like really, well, pre pandemic, she was like, had all these activities in Chinatown. She's like really busy um, uh, with like Tai Chi, with choir, with dance, with like, um, uh, calligraphy like painting lessons and all that so um you know i i knew that i didn't i only will ask my mom to help me when i'm <laughs> when i'm really like stuck and i need help quickly um with my dad um we we, we work together more um i mean my parents always come up with ideas too like we always talk about uh things that they've seen or things that interest all of us um do and, they identify as artists? Um, I I see them as artists. Yeah. Um, my I mean, my mom does uh, ink brush painting, so oh, I was wow. like, you can't not think of yourself as an artist. And, yeah. And they're just such beautiful. I mean, I'm totally biased because I'm her daughter, <laughs> and I I'm not you know I'm I'm not that familiar with the ink brush tradition. I just know what I <laughs> that thing where. I like what I see, or yeah. I, I know what I like. Or yeah. that, that. <laughs> um, and my dad, he, he, I, when he was young, so in the seventies, he was really into photography. And if it wasn't, I think if it wasn't because of family obligations to yeah. join like the restaurant, um, he would have continued on um, in studying photography. Um, and he's, he's always taken photographs and like as an amateur photographer and um the past year uh i think i like to think he was inspired by whose chinatown research where i showed him like the fred herzog photographs of jim wong chu's uh suzanne Girard and marie goudreau um uh, their their photographs and like and then he's like oh you mean i can just take photographs of chinatown yeah, and just like as documentation. So this whole this past I, this past year, he's just been taking photographs of Chinatown, oh. and um, yeah. And I just thought like this was it's. And when you look at it, it he's just got he's got an eye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's incredible. My um, I don't know what is it. It is about our Chinese dads. But my dad also uh, was a photographer, taught me how to like co do composition. Mm. Um, he also taught, he also taught um, calligraphy courses in like the cul-de-sac that I grew up in. 
um, in a small, small city in the Tri Cities. And um, I just took it for granted because he, you know, he had these classes and I just like dreaded going to them. But now as an adult, mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, what a missed mm -hmm. opportunity, you know, to be able to be an understudy of my own father and his craft and his art. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. it's so cool. I, love, I love that. My dad was also really artistic too. We So we had, um. <laughs> Uh, we, we all we, had arty dads. Yeah, we had. Uh, um, we should put it. We should put, organize a show of like we yes, should. arty dads. <laughs> we should. We should. So for we had a costume contest at church every year around Halloween as a replacement for Halloween, and there was, it was a contest, and we, and we were very very competitive, and the costumes just my dad just got more and more elaborate every year. Like I remember this like this elaborate like shark costume that he made out of card that like, he's like made out of cardboard and i think it even had like glowing red lights and oh stuff oh my god too. i love those glowing red lights yeah. <laughs> Um, Karen, before we forget to ask you this question, I want to ask you your your story with um, what's your st hot pot story? Um, oh. Did you grow up with it? What was that like? Um, and also, what's your favorite hot pot ingredient? Okay. Um, well, I didn't grow up really with hot pot. Maybe once in a while I did with like family, uh, uh, like my grandparents, aunts and uncles, like it was like the big family get together but with my parents uh, not until they sold the restaurant because uh, like it was a family run restaurant and so they were working like seven days a week from 10 in the morning till like two in the morning um so there wasn't really time you know they they just uh like wolf down dinner for lunch yeah. and so when they sold the restaurant i'll just kind of go off on a tangent a bit that was so i was um I guess I was like 26, 24, I don't know, something like that. And it was the first time we had dinner at home together. It wow. was the first time we like had a walk like as a family after dinner. It was the first time, like there was a lot of firsts. Mm -hmm. um, I was in my 20s, so I could say it's like the first time we had hot pot. <laughs> I was in my 20s. Wow. Um, but uh, my mom's been getting really into it, just like, you know, at home. Um, they found, like, I think her and, like, all her buddies, you know, oh, my gosh, there's, like, a sale um, at Canadian Tires for, like, $10. Or, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I guess a rice cooker or something. Like, so everybody bought it. And so it was, like, this this thing of, like, doing hot pot at home. Um, and uh, I guess my favorite ingredient is, might be different from what I wrote to you, but because I, I suddenly remember like a new thing for me was just like crab fish balls. Oh yeah, oh. I love that. Yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. might have said something like mushrooms, but now, now I think about it, like I, I think it was like the crab, crab fish balls. Mm, yeah. Those are one of my favorites too. <laughs> I've also recently discovered they have um, meatballs with cheese in them. Oh, yeah. what? Yes, the new, very new, new trendy hot, uh, hot pot meatballs <laughs> with what, cheese. What's weird. Kind of, what kind of cheese? It's, it's kind of, it's, I think it's like a mozzarella because it's quite like stringy. And it's mm. usually in like, I've only ever had it with like a beef ball. And it was, mm. it's really good. Um, I wonder what it's like with cheese curds. Oh, yeah. It's probably good because I know in Japan they put it on top of like um, the the ramen, mm. right? Yeah. And so they have like a, a cheese thing, and yeah. it's all gooey and umami. Yeah. Well, we did, as as we also discovered in our first episode, you know these these flavors like the ice cream and the hot <laughs> sauce, the LGM hot sauce. <laughs> Karen, I'm so inspired. I have to be so honest. Um, like this whole time when David and I were prepping for this talk with you um, and we we're just doing our research, looking at all your artwork and exhibitions, um, kind of stalking you online, <laughs> like, stalking your Wikipedia page. Like it's just, it's incredible what you've, you know, what you're, what you're doing. And it's really inspiring because David and I, like we want to do what you do. And so um, I wonder if you can just share some 
I don't know, words of wisdom um, oh. for any for any like emerging artists that you know want to do what we do, um, mm -hmm. maybe for even younger younger soon to be emerging artists um, mm -hmm. or little mm -hmm. kids out there. If you have any words. Oh wow. Uh something i guess um work hard <laughs> <laughs> sorry i said i was like no don't don't do the tiger mom thing you're like the <laughs> you're tiger allowed mom. <laughs> the tiger auntie since you know the, okay. the thing with the auntie is like work hard <laughs> um, but i guess Always be pushing yourself. Always be pushing uh, your concept, your ideas, um, your your skill set, um, and learning. I, th I think one thing that I'm I'm always willing to learn and pick up, say, new skills, um, or to just to learn about you know something that's caught my interest, um, and being open. I think the thing is being open to and attuned in a way like having your senses attuned and kind of being open to things that you might not have been aware of mm. does that make sense totally yeah. yeah it makes me think being also being responsive to right to what's mm -hmm. what's around um jen you, you and i have also been thinking about this in terms of what our our work um to and sort of responding to what's happening um around us as well yeah um, we're running out of time, but Karen, oh, I'm curious. Yeah. I know. How does that happen? It always goes by so fast. <laughs> Karen, um, what's 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 next? Um, it sounds like you have you have quite a few things happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's what do you have happening next? Um, I have a few shows coming up this year. Um, two solos. Um, one in Campbell River Art Gallery. Um, in I have three things in May, so in May, wow. and um, uh, a traveling show that was in Richmond Art Gallery, uh, I think two years ago. It's going to go to Markham, um, Toronto, and also in and in the summer I have a public art commission um, in Toronto, which I'm collaborating with T Base. Um, yay! yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then. Uh, I have two publications coming out. Um, wow! <laughs> <laughs> and then I, and then um, like another solo in September, and then I think I can take a break after. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe before we say goodbye to you, um, maybe, can you just maybe tell us, um, maybe give a, a quick blurb about the exhibit that we're in because we and thank you to the griffin griffin arts projects for letting us um in today to film no one's in the no one's in the gallery i have the gallery all to myself <laughs> hence no hence no mask um, <laughs> but yeah maybe you can just tell us uh, uh really quickly about the exhibit and um when how people can see it when people can sure. see it um so the exhibit who's chinatown is looking at the various depictions of chinatowns across canada by canadian artists historical and contemporary there's 29 artists ranging from um uh, 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 I'm blanking emily carr unity bainbridge um paul wong mary sui wong morris lum friends of chinatown toronto um to uh linda jang whose gate uh, Toronto East Chinatown Gate is behind you. Um, and I wanted to pull together just like, not just photographs, but sketches and paintings, um, and even uh, uh, ephemera, like restaurant matchbooks, uh, match covers and menus and such. And um, I really wanted to kind of have this as like a, a start of a conversation and of, of what is an art history of Chinatown. Um, like the, the who are the artists who we might not know who aren't in part of the canon for example like um in the in the historical section like the smaller gallery there's um we don't have the works of Yip Khan Ho or the works of Eugene Bond but because Eugene Bond was a model at um, Vancouver School of Art there's a lot of uh, portraits done by students and the and the professors um, at the art school of him. So we know what he looks like. And we know um, that Yi Kan Ho was uh, part of the graduating class, the first graduating class of VSA. Um, and so I wanted 
to bring them out into in the exhibition so that you know hopefully one day we will find these works um by these artists yeah. so yeah maybe sorry i have one more <laughs> i just don't want to let I you knew go. It. Sure. Um, well, so can you tell us what you're going to be doing with T-Base? Because I think we're talking to T-Base next week, Next right? week, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it just yeah. makes perfect um, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're still in conversation, so I hope I'm not saying anything where they'll be, like, really surprised. Really? That's what we're doing? Um, but, uh, yeah, I was talking with Florence Yi, and um, this is a... Uh, I, I was invited to... to to do a project, a public art project by Critical Distance Center for Curators um, for this summer as part of like Toronto's year of public art. And I wanted to do something, well, since, you know, like I've been thinking about Chinatown a lot, um, I wanted to do something about the, um, like reflecting gardens, like my grandparents' gardens, the vegetable gardens, um, and the growing of, of, um, I guess cultural foods, um, and thinking about one of my my surviving um, grandparent, my my papa, um, how she's she used to have a have a plot with a community garden, um, but because she broke her hip, she's she can't go far. So um, every year now she set up like. A balcony garden and she grows like all her gua and all her choy and like just everything and it's just incredible so I wanted to kind of do something like that but growing it like in one of the public spaces um, in Toronto Chinatown and because T-Base has has been running the anti-gentrification garden um, out of the, the Chinatown Plaza I thought they would be a great um, a great uh, group to collective to collaborate with because I didn't want to just be like an outside artist that just kind of like gets in, does something and goes away. And I, I wanted something where it was like really um, that we could work together. And so I've been collecting a lot of seeds. So thinking about, you know, the passing of knowledge. So collecting seeds from my parents, from their friends. Um, and I still have a lot of seeds from my, my Ningin who passed away like over 10 years ago. We still have them in those red, the red, um, those jars, like the, the Paul Long uh, that you showed last week. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, so that's, that, so what we're going to do is like a, a, an extension, I guess, of the, of the tea bases garden. Um, so that's where we're at at the moment. <laughs> Amazing. Incredible. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Okay. We've run out of time. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's been really, really wonderful having, <laughs> chatting with you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Good night. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> that so just flew by. Inspiring. Had... Listen, I'm just, I'm actually, I'm so moved by the ways in which Karen is so thoughtful in how she collaborates with everyone around her. And that like, it's reminding me of like how you and I often have those conversations around not parachuting into mm -hmm. communities or cities where we just drop in and, you know, take yeah. up space, but rather there is that intentionality and collaboration. Reciprocity and relationships, and, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, I'm so, I'm so yeah. excited. <laughs> so we've so, got um, T-Base next, next week. Wednesday. Um, yeah, and as, mm -hmm. as most people heard, they're, uh, they're a group in Toronto that has been doing a lot of cultural and activist work in, uh, in Toronto's Chinatown. So we're really excited. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so join us here at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time uh, next week. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>